All the people in this room are fully aware of Bob's talent in writing and what the magazine has accomplished over the years when nobody was willing to challenge the Clinton administration, which they thought was the reestablishment of the FDR coalition, which would permanently lock in democratic left of center control. The American Spectator was in many ways a little bit alone in being a voice that says this is really rotten and this is really a problem. Uh, and it stopped, it was part of the effort, central to the effort to stop the seizure of control over uh, health care and a whole series of other project lines that the left had ready. Um, and continues, the American Spectator with Bob's leadership, to give a place for the entire broad center-right coalition to talk about what's happening, what's good, what's wrong, where the center-right uh, movement ought to be and what we can accomplish. And uh, I know as somebody who works in politics that I really appreciate Bob Terrell's leadership long before I got engaged and continuing every day. Bob, you've changed the world, you have ch changed the arc of history, and not too many people have had the chance to do that. Bob Terrell. Come on now, you make me feel like Mussolini. <laughs> so I've got to counterbalance that with the way I start thinking about things today. Any time I think about a public appearance, I say to myself, glory to Ukraine, glory to Ukraine. <laughs> It is good to have you all here with us this evening to celebrate another edition of the annual Robert L. Bartley Dinner. As luck would have it, I have just finished writing my memoirs. So if uh, you sense that the wind is not quite strong in my sails, you're absolutely right. It took a lot out of me, but I hope this spring you'll take, a, you'll take an interest in this book. I, I envisioned my memoirs as a book about as big as the Bible but with a lot more laughs. My editors and my wife kept the book down to manageable length, but I wouldn't let them touch any of my jokes. <laughs> Certainly not one of my jokes about Bill Clinton and his lovely wife, Bruno. <laughs> Needless to say, <clears throat> Bob Bartley makes his appearance in the pages of my memoirs early and often, though not just when the, when the Clintons were mentioned. Bob was there to help me every time I needed a lifeline. And as you might recall, I needed several lifelines. He was a great man. And I've put him in a book filled with great men and women, Ronald Reagan, Tom Wolfe, Margaret Thatcher, and of course, Vladi Pliszczynski. <laughs> they are all there. The title of my memoirs is, How Do We Get Out of Here? my life from Bob Kennedy to Donald Trump. To find out how we got out, 
you'll have to read the book. And it should be available sometime in the spring or the early summer. Let us spend this jolly evening pretending that uh, those are angry Americans who make an issue over what public toilet they will use do not actually exist. I am talking about those people who create momentous controversies over which public toilet is to be the toilet of their choice. And for that matter, <clears throat> what locker room they prefer, and the personal pronoun they'd like to use, et cetera, et cetera. I am speaking of those who think that the toilet of their choice is a political matter, not a matter of personal hygiene. They also consider it a constitutional matter that ought to be brought before the Supreme Court, and probably will be before the Supreme Court if Joe Biden is reelected president. Throughout history, Laban Sarum, of one sort or another, has been the stuff of politics, as Vladimir Putin thought to make Laban Sarum the stuff of politics back in February of this year, much to his regret. Before Putin, there was Karl Marx, whose conception of politics was based on the grumpiness of the proletariat, of the grumpiness of Lem the plumber. Others with a leftist persuasion went further and based their vision of politics on the complaints of the lumpen proletariat. Still others have based their vision of politics on the superiority of the white race, or the superiority of the black race, or the superiority of short people. You might recall Napoleon Bonaparte Yet, only in America could the desiderata of the left become sufficiently infantile to base politics on the toilet of one's choice. Lenin, in World War I, chose the hammer and sickle as the symbol of the Communist Party, and millions of people died for it. Today, the American left has chosen as its symbol a solitary toilet, a toilet on a hill. <laughs> Flushing the toilet emphatically will become a revolutionary statement someday. Many years ago, at the American Spectator, we devised a bumper sticker that proclaimed simply, nuke the chinks. <laughs> no, no, no. It was nuke the whales. Now I can imagine the day when the American left will proclaim in all solemnity a bumper sticker urging that the enlightened flush the toilet. Possibly it will be accompanied by a solitary toilet and a reminder to wash your hands <laughs> when you've finished. Or if Dr. Fauci has anything to say about it, wash your hands and your feet. The politics the politics of the toilet has become the politics of the American left. The politics of the toilet has become the politics of the American left. Years ago, the British journalist Peregrine Warstorn claimed communism 
was not the most poisonous form of politics, nor was Nazism, nor fascism, the most poisonous form of politics. The most poisonous form of politics, in his opinion, was liberalism. I doubted this, his first prop proposition at first. Yet, after watching liberalism evolve in recent years, I have come to, the agree, to agree with Peregrine Warstorn. Communism, Nazism, and fascism are evil. But there are areas of, of, of public life in which these evils will never appear. On the other hand, there is no area in public life, private or public, where liberalism will not venture. And everywhere liberalism ventures, it brings with it ruin. Now, liberalism has even entered the realm of sexual identity, even the sexual identity of children, and it will end in ruin. The years ahead are going to be difficult, difficult years. Who would have thought that something as idiotic as wokeism would take over the great cities of our country and the educational system of our country, the universities, even the military? We at the American Spectator shall resist wokeism. And I invite you to, invest, to join us in that resistance. A year and a half ago, I had a hip removed, my left hip. I am told the surgeon looked longingly at my remaining hip. In fact, he actually looked up my torso to my heart but he did not proceed. After all, I would not be very productive without a heart. The surgeon who removed my hip and looked longingly to the other parts of my body got me to thinking about my succession at the American Spectator. Thus, a year and a half ago, I began looking for an editor to replace me in, in the day-to-day -day operations of the magazine. Not the strategic matters of the magazine, but the day-to-day -day matter, ma <clears throat> the day-to-day -day operation of the magazine. For 54 years, I have claimed to be the American Spectator's editor-in-chief for life. And it got me a lot of laughs. There is no reason to spoil a good joke by bowing out now. But in the years ahead, an editor with two hips is going to be necessary, especially if Hillary enters the race with her enormous hips. <laughs> well, as I say, I have my editor. He is a full professor at Grove City College. He has written some 20 books, all of which I recommend to you. Even now, he is writing the definitive history of the American Spectator. He has been supplying the magazine with stupendous articles for years and with talented young people. I agree with his every belief, and he agrees with me and Vladi and Melissa. You have been able to read him on a daily basis. 
Now you can meet him in the flesh. Ladies and gentlemen, may I introduce to you the editor of the American Spectator, Paul Kengor. Thank you, Bob, and uh, Velati, everybody, the board. I told Bob, I said, I hope they don't boo when, when, you, when you announce that. Thank you for not booing. That's, uh, that's, that's, that's much appreciated. You know, this is such an incredible honor and joy, and, and Bob asked me to speak for about five minutes about it, and given that I'm in the process of writing a 250,000-word history of the American Spectator, which I've been working on for the past three years. How do I, I don't know how to adequately convey in a few minutes how honored I am, and then more importantly, how special this magazine really is. And, and it truly is. So I shall try. And let me begin by sharing just a few names of, of some of the people who've written for and filled the pages of the publication since its founding in Bloomington in 1967. And I prepared a list, in fact, it's, it's how I lead the history of the American Spectator in the preface with all these different names. And right now, Bob and Velotti, who've seen that, that manuscript, are probably mortified thinking, he's not going to read all those names, is he? So no, I'm not. I would be here for, for an hour if I read all those names. But, but I want you all to hear a partial list of some of the people who've, who've written for this magazine over the last 55 years. Because I want you all to, all to know how special this is that, that you're all a part of. So here we go. Take notes, all right? Our Emmett Terrell Jr., Tom Wolfe, Milton Friedman, Malcolm Muggridge, William F. Buckley Jr., John Chamberlain, Luigi Barzini. These names coming back, right? Pat Buchanan, Russell Kirk, Irving Crystal, Frank Meyer, Henry Regnery, Daniel Patrick Moynihan. Bill Rusher, John O'Sullivan, George Gilder, Charles Murray, Priscilla Buckley, Richard Pipes, Herb Stein, Ben Stein, Eric Hoffer, Thomas Sowell, Claire Booth Luce, Midge Dechter. I could go on and on like this. I'll give you a few more. Vladi Plazinski, America's best editor. John Lukash, the late Walter Williams. Paul Johnson, Robert Bartley, Britt Hume, David Brooks, William Manchester, Richard Nixon. Robert Conquest, Robert Novak, Michael Novak, Roger Scruton, Mary Eberstadt, Florence King, Joseph Sobrin, Christopher Hitchens, Peter Hitchens, Terry Eastland, Andrew Ferguson, Fred Barnes, Tom Bethel, who we lost recently. Vic Gold, James Taranto, who I think is here tonight. For the record, I haven't yet gotten to the 21st century. That's just, that's just a few names, and I'm telling you, it's an abbreviated list. Michael Barone, Robert George, Robert Bork, Al Regnery, Jonah Goldberg, Amity Schles, Frank Buckley, Rich Lowry, Rod Dreher, Henry Kissinger, DeRoy Murdoch, Herb London, George Weigel, Roger Kimball, Cato Byrne, Stephen Moore, Mark Stein, John Fund, who I think is here tonight, James Annell, but I'll, um, I'll stop. I could, I could go on and on reading for an hour with names like this. And then there, are, then there are people who started at the American Spectator. George Will, Bill Crystal started writing for the American Spectator when he was 16 years old. It's true. Bill McGurn. Greg, Greg Gutfeld, who was an intern, stayed at Bob's house. Malcolm Gladwell started as an intern, started his first full-time job at the American Spectator. But what really stands out in the life of the American Spectator are the printed words, and that's what I first saw when I was an undergraduate biochem, biophysics major at the University of Pittsburgh in the late 1980s. I was a pre-med student. I was working for the organ transplant team at the University of Pittsburgh. 
I thought that's what I was going to do as my life calling. And I would spend days going to Presbyterian University Hospital and Children's Hospital in Pittsburgh dealing with terminally ill transplant patients. And at the end of the day, I needed a good laugh. And I would get it from the American Spectator. I laughed and laughed and laughed, and I learned. I learned how to become, I learned how to be a conservative. By the end of it, I was a conservative. And like the American Spectator, I learned to have fun being boldly conservative. And as Bob just showed, politically incorrect in the, in the process. Switched my major. I became the editorial page editor of my student newspaper, the, the Pitt News, where I met a pretty copy editor named Susan Pahanish, who's sitting right here, who's now um, my wife, who's with me here tonight. We left, the, we left the eight kids at home, didn't bring them along. We had to bribe my second oldest to babysit them, right? right? I mean, literally had to bribe them to babysit them so they, to, to get Susan here with me. Uh, actually, we didn't leave at home, Bob. We left them at your house. So they're there waiting for you when you come. I hope you got some rest. So they're, they're waiting for you and Jean with, with the dog, Minka. But once in graduate school in the 1990s with no money, I scraped up just enough dollars as a student at American University to keep my subscription to the American Spectator. It kept me sane. It was, it was therapeutic. It's one of the only things that got me through, through graduate school in the academic asylum. Few citadels of conservatism waged the battle of ideas quite like the American Spectator. None with the wit and panache, the outright hilarity, the fearlessness and delightful political incorrectness. Bob and his merry band of rogues were cheerful warriors, or as James Tarano called it in a Wall Street Journal profile of Bob a few years ago, happy warriors. Even liberals laughed, sometimes, <laughs> when reading the magazines opening The Continuing Crisis or The Closing Current Wisdom, which was written by what group? Anyone remember? Assorted, assorted jackasses who wrote the current wisdom section. And a few publications made the waves, the controversy, and history that the American Spectator did in the process, particularly with the riotous exposés on Bill Clinton and Hillary Clinton, or as Bob called him, Boy Clinton and his lovely wife, Bruno. <laughs> the Spectator versus the Clintons in the 1990s was an epic showdown that quite literally led to the impeachment of Bill Clinton. I thought that would get an applause. I have an applause line here, but no, all right, all right, all right. <laughs> for that matter, few conservative publications have been at it for so long. The American Spectator and National Review are the two patriarchs in the conservative literary world. National Review began in 1955. The American Spectator began as the alternative in 1967. So to sum up, because I promised Bob I wouldn't go over five minutes, to, uh, to have this position is truly an incredible honor. And let me clarify that Bob remains editor-in-chief. I'm editor. And at some point, Bob will become editor emeritus, or as I think I'll always call him, uh, editor eternal of, uh, of the American Spectator. This publication is special. And those of you who are, who are here or watching online, you know, Ben Stein, John Coyne, you know, Ben and John and the late um, Aram Bakshian have been writing for this magazine since 1972. 50 years, 50 years. <laughs> Nobody has been writing for Spectator as long as, uh, other than Bob, than those three. Roger Kaplan, Dan Flynn, Jeff Lord, Jeff Fisher, or, uh, Dov Fisher, Scott McKay, David Catron, George Newmayer, Yogi Grover, Ellie Hanna, Melissa Leonora, the Wall Street Journal guys that are in attendance. And I'll just stop there because I, I, I don't want to leave anybody out. But um, they're all really part of something very special. All of you are. And those of you in the room, if you, if you haven't written for us, Get at it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get, get after you. So all the conservative greats of the past 50 years have. 
they literally all have. Evan McGuire used to say, uh, you know, you go back and read the pages of, of the American Spectator, everybody wrote for us. So yeah, they did, they did. And so let's continue to keep it special. Right. If funny, witty, hilarious, politically incorrect, with uh, fearless wit, with great writers and great writing. And that's, uh, that's my goal, to carry on continuity. So, so thank you all very much. I'm humbled by this. And I should leave before I start crying. God bless you. Thank you very much. <laughs>